So welcome again to everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you, Julia. Um, we are, I'm as we all know, we're in this um, global situation happening right now. And Julia stepped up and um, changed her topic to address what's happening now in our world um, for people dealing with addictions um, and mental health issues. Um, so um, we're going to let Julia take it take it from here. And then Julia, you and I will go back a little bit. Um, we have started the recording and then I will go mute myself in a minute and get let some more folks in. So welcome Julia Ross and welcome to all of you here at the Alliance for Addiction Solutions. Thank you very much, Patty. And I'm delighted to be here as always. Um, My problem uh, increasingly every year is that uh, I know too much and uh, it makes it very hard for me <laughs> to figure out how to start uh, and where to stop. Um, but it's, it's also fun uh, to be able to share with you uh, what I know and particularly at this time, um, I've been doing a lot of, of summits and webinars and so forth. Um, but this particular group of people um, is the most important group, as far as I'm concerned, in the world at this time. So what is it about COVID and addiction and the people in the world who know the most about how we can beat addiction? That's what I'm talking about today. And why do I need to talk to you about addiction? It's because the, the addicted group that is most at risk now of contracting COVID-19 and of dying from it belongs to um, a group that is very little recognized, although it is, it comprises the largest group of addicted people in the world. Uh, and it is the most deadly, uh, has the highest death rate from the addiction of any group in the world. Mm. Um, it is the group currently that is um, comprising 90% of those who need to be on ventilators. This is in this country. It was first reported in France. Um, at any age, uh, above and below 60, this group of addicts is the most endangered of all citizens of this country. So what is this addiction and why am I talking to you about it um, today. Uh, I'm talking to you about it because this is an addiction that most people in the addiction treatment field do not recognize. But that includes many of you and many of us in this group that is the most sophisticated, the most effective in terms of addiction treatment. Um, and I want us to be thinking about why that is, you know, what is it about this particular addiction that needs all of our atten attention and skill um, that has eluded us uh, for so long. Uh, I myself didn't recognize it until I'd been in the field for seven years. Um, and I was alerted to it by one of my counselors who was suffering from it and not finding help and she said, this program is to help people in the 12-step programs who aren't getting enough, right? In the 12-step programs. So what can we do for my addiction? Because I'm not alone with this addiction. And I was so surprised that she had the addiction. I was so surprised that she wasn't alone. Uh, and she had to work with me for several weeks, actually months, before I was able to see it right in front of my face. So I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm here to raise our consciousness. Um, 
if it hadn't been for this particular counselor, and then a group of PhDs, uh, including Joan Matthews Larson, Kenneth Blum, and Carl Pfeiffer, uh, I would not be here talking as an expert in this most um, serious uh, of all addictions. Um, so we're talking about addiction to uh, what for over 2 million years has been considered the most uh, nutritious uh, substance on the planet. Um, we call it food, uh, have called it food all this time, uh, but I would like to, as of today, have you all refer to the edible substance that we are now uh, suffering a pandemic of addiction to, I would like you to start calling it techno carbs, techno K A R B Z. This is one of the big points that I make in my book, The Craving Cure, which is entirely about dealing with processed food addiction, primarily to sweets and starches. So techno carbs are not foods. These are drugs. These are drugs dressed up like foods. They are. They come in very cute outfits. Um, <laughs> and have tremendously cute advertisement. Um, but they're deadly drugs, the most deadly of all drugs in terms of the number of people suffering and dying prior to COVID. So what is it that, um, that keeps us from seeing this? And the reason I'm saying this is because I'm training people they're addiction specialists, they're psychotherapists, they're nutritionists, and they don't see this. You know, I learned this, you know, from one who came, I certified her. And a year later, I said, okay, it's time for your recertification process. Um, are you going to bring in some cases? And I had made a prerequisite that everybody who got recertified needed to read The Craving Cure and have a case, at least one of their cases, that would involve a food addict. And she said, no, I'm giving up my certification rather than do this because, and she was getting a lot of clients from my website. Uh, she said, after thinking about it, I realized I have a food addiction and I've got to deal with it before I really can um, present myself as an expert. Um, so that's telling you, here's a professional who is slitting her own you know, financial throat because she can't give up certain edible drugs. Wow. Let's, let's extract from that the lesson that food addicts are dealing with uh, a substance that they can't give up in spite, despite adverse consequences. So losing clients and income is one thing. How about losing your life. Um, it's absolutely predictable that someone who is addicted to carbohydrates would become diabetic. And for that reason, about 50% of the country is either pre-diabetic or full bore diabetic. Um, so that means we have to give up our lives because we can't give up the substance, right? It's not a choice. This is not a lifestyle choice. This is a hardcore addiction. And the food industry has been taken over by the tobacco industry, which is cl clearly expert in addicting people to drugs. And they have used the, the science they had developed uh, to make tobacco more addictive, to make food more addictive. And it's working. Uh, so we're willing to give up our lives, our, our, our income. Uh, what about our, what about our bodies? Deformity is the first thing that happens, right? We gain unnatural, unneeded weight. Despite that, despite our inborn, ancient vanity, <laughs> we cannot give up these foods. 
So why don't we recognize this? Well, the obvious thing is that most addiction professionals are in recovery from some other substance and they have switched from that substance to sugar, to caffeine, to uh, tobacco, you know, in a lot of cases. So that's sort of understandable. I remember the, one of the first professionals that I ever lectured to about this subject came up to me, big guy, he owned 28 uh, recovery homes, uh, the TLCs, you know, the support after treatment homes. Um, he was crying. And he said, you scare me. If I give up the sugar and the caffeine, I am going back. And if I go back, that is the end of my life. And I thought I had just given a lecture that was the most hopeful thing imaginable about, yes, this is an addiction, but look at what we've got to fix it. All he could see was he couldn't give it up. So that this is going to be true for a, a lot of people on this call, you know, in this class, um, the raising of consciousness and, and becoming more aware. Um, once again, our field is being led by the neuroscientists in this case by Nora Volkow, who's the head of the national Institute for drug addiction, who said to the field, the data is so overwhelming, the field has to accept it. We are finding tremendous overlap between drugs in the brain and food in the brain. In other words, drugs in the brain and drugs in the brain. So, then there are those of us who, who don't have a food, particular food problem. Well, we have a different issue in terms of denial. We think food is healthy because for us, it has been. Uh, so we've got a lot of things um, getting in the way of our being able to help the people who most need it now. So it's the obese and the diabetic that are using those 90% of those ventilators. They are far more likely to contract COVID and to die from it. Why are they obese and diabetic? We never had it, obesity or diabetic problems uh, before 1970. Diabetes was less than 1% in the 1960s. In the 60s, we didn't even study people's weights. It had been such a non-issue for so long. It wasn't until the 70s when we started having this weird, completely unprecedented weight gain that we started to look at it as a problem. And of course, our solution was low calorie dieting. Uh, and we have continued with that solution ever since. And look at how successful it's become. We are now about 50% obese. There are three levels of obesity. Uh, and 80% of us are overweight. This is compared to uh, non-issue in the 19. 50s and most of the 60s. Um, so by eating these foods and overeating these foods, two things happen. We, we become brain addicted and all the neurotransmitters and the blood sugar problems that underlie other substance addictions underlie food addiction. So this is one thing. I'll take care of it. Uh, Julia, can I hold, can you hold for a second? I'm going to un unmute everybody. Someone's, um, can you hold one sec? Except Thanks. me. <laughs> no, that's not you. I'm going to mute everybody and bring you back. And, and please announce that if people are moving, please, please turn off your video. Yes, please, if you're moving around, turn your video off. And as you come on, mute your phone. We'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end. And, and I will have a cue for you, which is what are you eating during this webinar? <laughs> okay, Julia. Uh, okay. And any answer is acceptable. Uh, so we are becoming brain deranged, as all addicts must. We are also suffering totally unprecedented, unprecedented levels 
in the developed world of malnutrition. Because the foods that we're eating are almost entirely composed of completely damaged and refined sugars and starches and fats. So no value there, but there's really no room, you know, you really, for foods that contain nutrients, right? They're not addictive. So they don't get included, which means that our overall diet is 60% nutrient void. Anybody who is dependent on prepared food is suffering from severe malnutrition. So that contributes to the problem with the brain. The good thing about this population of addicts is, is this. Despite what I just said, they are more stable than drug addicts, typically. They will, and they're highly motivated, uh, at least on a short term, to try anything new that might help. So, you, you know, if you can get their attention, they are wonderful to work with. And this is a time when we can get their attention. Um, so, we can talk later about what we're going to do about our own denial, but let's talk now about what we're going to do uh, now that we recognize we have full bore uh, addicts sitting in front of us, even if it's donuts, cookies, uh, even organic, um, rather than meth. Uh, and when I say rather than, I was going to say meth and opiates, um, but really, these foods are servicing all of the same areas of the brain that meth and opiates, cannabis, alcohol, um, benzodiazepines, they've got it all in one, in a cute little package that tastes delicious. No wonder it's the biggest addiction. Who needs the other drugs, you know, if, if you can get off on these drugs? So... We, I am not alone in uh, making this, uh, con drawing this conclusion that foods affect the same parts of the brain that drugs and alcohol do. This is another gift, yet another gift. They've been giving us gifts since the early 80s from the world of neuroscience. They are continuing to research all the time to figure out how, now, finally they got, you know, it got our attention, Kenneth Blum, uh, did his first and only uh, study on food addicts in 1997. And there had been uh, studies in the 80s, um, but once tryptophan was banned, they stopped doing that. Once the, the focus was on helping the drug companies, these more widely beneficial studies stopped. But Ken uh, did a fabulous study on optifasters uh, after two years showing tremendous uh, differences between the group that were on a fairly low potency amino acid blend and, and the group that weren't on anything. And we're talking about 120 people in each group. Um, so much less weight regain, uh, much less craving, uh, much better overall health and well-being. A lot of details in that study. It's, it's just wonderful. Uh, but Subsequently, there have been a few studies, and I want you to know that when I say this is an opportunity for us, COVID, I'm, I'm showing you here a study done in Italy since the COVID disaster over there. And the name of the study is Nutritional Recommendations for COVID-19 Quarantine. Quarantine. And the, 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 the word that is most often uh, used in this document is the word tryptophan. They're not talking about supplements, but they're almost there. They're talking about how important it is that we get enough tryptophan in our food because it makes serotonin, makes melatonin, we'll, we'll eat better, we'll feel better, we'll sleep better. Uh, tremendous excitement in the new wave of neuroscientists who don't know that tryptophan was ever banned. You know, they weren't ever terrified by that. Uh, horrible, um, criminal 
um, misuse of, uh, of tryptophan, uh, misproduction of tryptophan. So they're, what they're confirming is, yes, sugar is an opiate. Gluten-containing flour is an opiate. Milk products are opiates. They all specifically target the opiate centers in the brain. And we find, now that I'm running this, um, uh, a, an entirely virtual clinic, specifically for food cravers, uh, is that the most common cause of addiction to these three foods in particular, which often come together, right? We've got our ice cream, our ice cream sandwiches. We've got flour, we've got sugar, and we've got milk products. Okay, so um, ice cream, uh, I have a generally very healthy family, but every single one of us has been addicted to ice cream. Um, I had to give it up because it started giving me a stomach ache, and I was able to, uh, but uh, the rest of my family, uh, lifelong uh, ice cream addicts, not, no, not dangers, very moderate addicts. But, uh, so when we combine these foods, we get an exaggeration of the impact on whatever neurotransmitters are getting targeted. So that's one of the reasons that they're so much stronger it's not just sugar, it's sugar with dairy products and sugar with, uh, with milk products. Um, it's sugar with chocolate, you know, probably the most well-known drug of all time worldwide. Um, it was called bliss. Uh, that was the uh, Aztec word, um, the Inca word, whatever. Um, that was the Aztecs. Okay. So people are drawn because they need comfort. And now in particular, right? We've, we're isolated, we're threatened with death, poverty, destitution, uh, whatever. Um, so no wonder the sale of junk foods is going way, way up just the way the sale of ice cream is. Uh, sorry, ice cream, alcohol is, um, only more so. So uh, what, about, what about serotonin? That was the first neurotransmitter that, we, that was ever studied in terms of effect on appetite. And sure enough, sugar raises levels of serotonin briefly. And they, they found that out in the 70s. It was one of the first things they looked for. Um, and the studies all confirmed it. Um, so that's another very popular reason for people to be craving sugar right now and, and forever um, because it's very easy to become tryptophan deficient. Uh, you know, people aren't eating that much protein anymore because they're filling up on sugar and starch. Um, even if you ate really, you know, solid meals with plenty of protein, of the 20 kinds of protein, 20 amino acids, you're only going to get a small input from the tryptophan because there isn't as much tryptophan as there is for the other 19. Uh, so there's a lot of competition to get into the brain and tryptophan just doesn't make it. Um, it's one of the reasons that sugar is so addictive for low serotonin people that it will raise blood sugar, insulin levels will rise to get rid of the sugar Turns out the insulin doesn't just get rid of the sugar, it gets rid of a lot of the competing amino acids in the bloodstream. In floats tryptophan, which is not impacted by sugar for whatever reason. And people start feeling better. Of course, it doesn't last. They've got to get another sugar infusion to make that happen. Um, so these are two of the five types of sugar addiction. We've got the low endorphin sugar addicts. We've got the low serotonin sugar addicts. And what if you're getting both? You've got a double addiction. You've got the, the opiate effect, you've got the, the serotonin effect. And, and of course, so many of us, because of this diet, are hypoglycemic, right? So our glucose levels in the brain, there is no backup in the brain for stored sugar like there is in the muscle. 
no, no, no. Uh, we are stuck if we don't have enough glucose. So when, it, when levels drop, our cravings for immediate glucose kick in. So that gives us three different kinds of craving. I was speaking at the Hypoglycemia Foundation. Uh, they did a, a, a podcast with me and we had a fascinating conversation about this. They, all they care about is, is blood sugar crashes, you know, reactive hypoglycemia. And what we realized as we were talking was, okay, we have a solution, right? We know that glutamine the aminoglutamine converts into glucose very sensitively, only as needed in instance. End of problem. But then, but then the, the founder said, yeah, but I took the questionnaire and it turns out I don't just have the symptoms of hypoglycemia. I'm not type two, the crashed craver. No, I've got all of them. So therefore I am going to eat specific foods that are gonna make my hypoglycemia worse. And that's why I've never entirely been able to get rid of it. She had this tremendous aha, just taking the questionnaire. Uh, that's, that's a podcast um, that I would uh, recommend to you. It was really interesting. Or is it a webinar? I can't tell the difference. I can't remember the difference. Anyway, if you go to uh, my website and to the events page, you'll see, uh, that that, uh, that interview is up there. Um, okay, so, so now we have three different massive addictor, addiction factors at play, just with a little, you know, a little Oreo. Uh, we've got opiates, we've got uh, serotonin infusion, we've got uh, blood sugar boost. Um, so what about stress? Everybody's talking about stress. Well, if we can fix serotonin, which we can with either tryptophan or 5-HTP in minutes, uh, well, we've, uh, we've done a lot. We can help people with sleep with tryptophan 5 -H and 5-HTP and or we can help them with uh, worry, we can pessimism, uh, negativity, insomnia. You know, it's endless what uh, almost what, what uh, tryptophan or 5-HTP will do by raising serotonin levels, but it doesn't get at the adrenaline uh, as effectively as GABA. So GABA is a neurotransmitter like serotonin that is our natural benzodiazepine, it's our natural tranquilizer because it specifically turns down levels of adrenaline. We need that now and people are eating for stress, and there is a category of stress eaters who don't have enough GABA have, or have too much adrenaline, too much cortisol, not enough cortisol. They've got you know, an adrenal brain deficit going, um, and uh, about 70% of, of those who are experiencing a lot of stress, uh, are overstressed, um, are overeaters. 30% don't eat at all because their cortisol is so high they don't have an appetite, you know. Um, so we've got to factor them in. So now we have a fourth type of food addiction. Those who are addicted to food because it calms them down. It changes the level of adrenaline in their system. Um, it raises cortisol. Um, Sugar is known to do that as part of the process. So we can cope with better briefly um, and feel less stressed. Um, so, so now we have four reasons for food addiction and a lot of people are eating because all four of those areas of the brain require help, um, however destructive that help is. So there's only one more and that one has to do with caffeine. So the natural caffeine, our natural caffeine is made from the neurotransmitters, the little family uh, that I call the cats, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, and adrenaline. Um, and a lot of people are out of those too. So they don't just want the milk and the sugar products, they want it with caffeine. 
So those are the, that's the reason Starbucks is like, you know, one of the top money makers of all time, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons that I want everybody to learn how to go off of caffeine themselves and with their clients. Um, one of my uh, problems with caffeine, even at moderate amounts, is that I've seen so many thousands of food addicts who didn't eat in the morning, which is critical. It's not just the amino acids. We got to eat in the morning and we got in the middle of the day and we got to eat at night um, and in between as needed. But they don't eat in the morning because they're not hungry because they wake up to coffee. So we got to get the coffee out of there. And fortunately, we have tyrosine. Coffee detox is nothing when you have tyrosine. Um, I, I, I was on a radio program years ago with a guy who owned a bunch of health food stores. And he said, you know, I have to admit to you on the air, you're talking about, you know, caffeine. And I am, I've got a serious addiction. I've tried to go off at least 12 times. And each time I get the most terrible headaches and I just can't do it. And I said, okay, let's do a caffeine challenge. Um, I'll come on the program again in a month. And meanwhile, you will go on uh, the, the tyrosine detox protocol. And in a month, you'll report. Uh, and we did it. And in a month, he was laughing. And he said, that was easy as pie. I didn't have uh, migraines at all. Uh, I, I was able to get off of it without a problem. And I love the way I feel on the tyrosine. He said, in fact, you know, it's been four weeks and I'm already tapering the amount of tyrosine I need down. So in terms of food addicts, caffeine can be one of our biggest um, enemies and the other uh, can be low calorie dieting. So let's say, you know, we give people all the aminos they need depending on how they score in the various uh, classes of addiction. You know, are they an opiate type addict, a comfort craver? Are they a low serotonin addict, et cetera? That's where we have to start though. Years ago, we just gave people more protein. They got more amino acids and they, they were pretty comfortable going off junk food. That was a long time ago. So now, because it's so hardcore, because the industry has become so much better at addicting us, we have to use the, we almost always have to use the aminos. So, um, I, and a lot of people are, um, understandably uh, drawn to the idea of group dietary uh, improvement. And it is great and it's great fun. I was just talking to Chris about this the other day. Uh, but if you don't include the aminos in your process, the group cohesion and your dynamism and you know the virtues of the food they're eating are gonna carry them a certain way. But relapse from food addiction is like, you know, everybody knows about that. Oh yeah, I was on a diet, but you know, I couldn't stick with it. So if we plunk in the aminos before we say, you cannot improve your, you know, this, this, this process isn't gonna start in terms of your diet until your cravings are gone. So we're not gonna try and starve you from your, gradually withdraw you from drug foods, no. We're gonna fix your brain, the cravings are gonna be gone, and you'll want and enjoy and adore healthy food. Um, so uh, that is the, uh, in a nutshell, what's involved in protecting people um, as much as we can, you know, from the virus is getting them away from this food. They're not going to lose all their weight immediately. They're not going to, well, they are, be, their blood sugar is going to normalize immediately though. If they have any capacity to make insulin at all left and all pre-diabetics do, and most diabetics, when, when they can change their diet, their glucose insulin numbers normalize quickly. Their A1C normalizes. Studies show this, but uh, they need the aminos in order to stay off the, those foods. But if we can stop the, the uh, dynamic of diabetes, uh, 
the influx of toxic foods that are suppressing the immune system, causing inflammation, um, and we can do it overnight using the aminos, we are a gold mine for the rest of the world. Um, at, at this point, um, I'd like to uh, talk about the liquid portion of this, uh, this talk um, and the fact that uh, alcohol sales have um, gone up uh, over 50% um, since the beginning of the um, isolation. Um, and um, I think all of us have been trying to think of ways that we can help people who are suffering mood-wise, sleep-wise, health-wise. Um, from, you know, from this isolation, let alone the virus. Um, and uh, one of our uh, most um, productive and creative and effective uh, Alliance members, who's also on the board of directors, uh, is here today uh, because she is a specialist in using virtual techniques to help alcoholics. So she's perfectly positioned for this particular time. And uh, Chris Engine is gonna talk to us uh, about at least one of the people that she's seeing now and what kind of a structure she's created that is being so successful at bringing people, the people to her who need it right now. Um, let me just ask, is uh, Jen Bruce here, another board member of the Alliance? Um, okay. Uh, she, she has some interesting things to say about her. She, she's a recovering person and the alcoholics in her community are having a hell of a time right now and she's just drawing them in like flies and they're having a wonderful experience and she's really seeing for the first time how quickly a lot of people can get better. Um, so tell us about your experience, Chris. Okay. Hi. Can everybody hear me? I'm outside, so there's some You're better. a little you're a little low. I, I'm having a little bit of trouble. What? But Kathy can. <laughs> okay. So yeah, hi everybody. I'm Chris Engen. Um, my company's Nutrition for Recovery. And um, thanks for the intro, Julia. I'm also on the board of directors of the Alliance for Addiction Solutions um, and the membership chair, which I'll put a little hint, hint. Everybody should sign up to be a member of the Alliance. Um, we're offering the membership for only $49 for the year right now, which is a tremendous reduction because we want everybody to get involved in this effort. So. Um, you can go to the website, allianceforaddictionsolutions.com and sign up to be a member after this talk, but we'd love to see you there. Um, so yes, I have been working virtually um, primarily with alcoholics, um, some drug users in using amino, doing amino acid therapy. And um, right now my process I feel like the categories that I see are there's people who are trying to quit alcohol that are still using, and then there's people that are in recovery from alcohol that have transferred from alcohol to sugar, <laughs> um, which is a common, very common um, phenomenon for people to switch addictions like that. And of course, there's lots of overlap. So I just absolutely love what I do helping this community. Um, and what I do is I have them fill out Julia's uh, chart, which is an amino acid therapy chart. That's a mood, a symptom tracker for moods in the different categories um, that she mentioned, serotonin, GABA, endorphins, catecholamines, and then of course the hypoglycemic um, section, which is extremely important um, for relapse prevention would be, is making sure that alcoholics in recovery um, are not experiencing the cravings from reactive hypoglycemia. 
And uh, so I have people fill out that chart, sometimes the craving type chart, and do an intake, of course, because there's precautions with aminos that we have to look at um, for the individual piece. And, um, and then I just conduct a, a 45, 50 minute conversation with them and am able to give them a recommendation right away on which aminos I think will work best for them given their symptoms and how it's presenting. Um, and then virtually I have access to either a trialing kit or um, the online dispensary that I use where especially in COVID it's wonderful because they just click a button and the aminos are delivered straight to their doorstep. And then we conduct a trialing, again, virtually th through a messaging system where I instruct my clients to, um, when they get the aminos, message me because I've got a recommended starting dose based on the intake um, and their you know, unique biochemistry that I'm working with. Maybe they're on an SSRI or you know, certain, certain things I need to work around. Um, and then we trial the dosing to get to the right starting dose. And then I have them schedule the next follow-up call a week later where I will chart again. So like what, what Julia, just since COVID, um, which has strangely for me been kind of a blessing because I've been able to really, I'm very fortunate that um, it's given me a lot more time to dig into my business. I have three teenagers that I used to drive to and from through three different schools. So um, it's really given me time to, to get this procedure in place. And there are three people that come to mind that I've worked with just since the start of um, our coronavirus journey six weeks ago that have been able to turn around their symptoms um, in a week, <laughs> in a day, really. Um, and I know we're sort of getting short on time and I can maybe just give kind of a top line idea of what that looks like. One person, she um, was struggling with the nightly wine habit. Um, she was not physically addicted to wine, but she'd start thinking about it in the morning um, and really would quit for a couple of days, but then went right back to it. Um, and so uh, with her, and I've got a chart right here, um, her cravings in all categories were 10, meaning low serotonin cravings, low catecholamine cravings, low GABA cravings, <laughs> not low endorphin cravings, but and hypoglycemic cravings. Um, so her cravings were across the board off the charts. And, and then her main other symptom were the low cats that Julia was talking about. Um, so the sluggish, kind of slow, sluggish, unable to get going, um, depression, apathetic depression, and she was actually using alcohol. So I know, I think Julia, you and I talked about this a little rare to be a low cat alcoholic, um, but that's what that's what I found. And um, with tyrosine and glutamine, and that's it. This person went from, again, if you could see the chart, it's kind of hard to audio explain what I'm talking about, but um, her symptoms were literally almost completely resolved after the first week. And that of course was also one very important thing is she was intermittent fasting. You know, she didn't even know why she was intermittent fasting. She was just intermittent fasting because, you know, the restriction, oh, I overdrank last night, so now I'm not gonna eat. And um, so I said, this was a great conversation. I said to her, I want you to promise me you're going to eat breakfast. <laughs> She's like, no, I, and I, no, you need to eat breakfast. And I gave recommendation, the egg, the little egg muffins um, and all high protein breakfast. And um, she said, she, when I told her that her first thought was, I'm not going to do that. Like she has that instant, like, I'm not going to do what she recommends because she can't possibly be right. I've been taught my whole life that this low calorie, this restrictive way of eating, which is how she was interpreting the intermittent fasting, that that's the way that she's going to do it. But she did. She said, no, and I'm going to trust the process. She was a lovely person to work with. Um, I love the people that trust me. Trust me, you guys. <laughs> so she, um, she said, eating breakfast, what a, what a remarkable idea, Chris. Like she was, kept her brain online as we talk about the prefrontal cortex logic access to your, hmm, I don't want to drink. I want to, uh, I, 
I have access to my different programs and resources and therapy and all of the things that are coming in because she is now understanding that the biochemical piece is being fixed. And um, so combined with the food and the tyrosine, and she tried the tyrosine at 500 milligrams in the morning, and that was not quite enough. So we went up to 1,000. And then I did the high dose, dose glutamine between meals four times a day for the cravings across the board. So 2,000 milligrams um, upon arising mid morning, mid afternoon, and after dinner. And in, I mean, in two days, she said, I don't even know. She said, I don't even know it seems so far away that I even had all those cravings. Like she's, she said these key phrases that I like to hear, like uh, my, my, this is how other people must feel. I feel so balanced And this beautiful story of how she used to on Saturdays, cause that was like an early drinking day. She used to scramble, scramble, scramble to get all of her stuff done so she could start to drink. And she said her, her son, her little son interrupted her and wanted to play and her, her, you know, her first thought was, no, I have to keep. And then she was able to give herself that pause, which is what the aminos do, right? The pause where she could think and go, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and play with my son. <laughs> so um, I, I've got three other cases, but that's probably enough to. Yeah, yeah. No, that's perfect. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's really just. Appreciate beautiful. it. You know, I think one thing that, that we, I want you all to know is that Chris is a nutritionist. Um, so she's talking about food too, and those marvelous recipes and, you know, just is so well organized with the clients and so, um, inspiring that they just, they just want to do what she says, you know, uh, and it works. Uh, At least so, everyone wants to do what I say, you know, like I said, I have three teenagers, so. <laughs> ah, right. You're not going to get a big head with three teenagers. Okay. So, um, Patty, um, we promised that we would yes. have some Q&A at the end. Yes. Um, we have so it right now. Any so cues out there besides mine? Well, here's what I'm going to do, everybody. First of all, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing that. And Julia, thank you again for um, all that you're providing for us. So we're go I'm going to open up. I'm going to unmute everybody and then ask you to mute your own phone. And then one at a time, people can come on and ask Julia. I think that's the best way we can do this. So give me a moment and I'm gonna unmute everybody. There are 87 people on the call. So I appreciate you really being um, patient and not all your questions may be answered, but um, here we go. Hold on. Okay, so now please mute yourself and then put it at a time. Yeah. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. Yeah, we may have trouble with this with that many people. I've never had 87 on a call. Um, I remember that. Yeah, so um, I'm going to have to go back in. Why don't anybody who wants to. Hold on. So that maybe we can hear a name and call that name. Why don't, you, why don't we try that? Um, can you say it again, Julia? Because I had to unmute you in order oh, sure. to, yeah. Uh, here's my suggestion that uh, if you want to ask a question, you say very clearly a couple of times what your first name is. So we're bound to hear somebody's first name and we'll pick one and we'll go with that since uh, otherwise I don't see how we can get a, uh, a cue going. If okay, can, there's a raise hold on, here. Hold on, I'm gonna unmute Carolyn. Hold on, Carolyn, one sec, please. But you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Chris. Feature. Go ahead, Chris. Speak. There's a raise hand feature. If everybody goes to the participant list and they click raise hand, that person um, is signals they have a question, and then you can call on them. Do you see that? Uh, yeah, I'm going, but there's 86, so I'm trying to figure out how. Yeah. Just pick one at random. Who's oh, got Chris. Raise. Kim Paris. Yes, Kim. Kim has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Kim, go ahead. Hi, thank you for inviting me, Chris, to this. This was very interesting. Um, I have a question. I've, I gave up alcohol eight months ago, and I did not replace it with sugar like I had in the past. And it didn't seem like the cravings were as bad, but 
recently with all the stress and everything, I've been eating a ton of sugar. Like I'm addicted to two cups of hot chocolate a day. And then I've been making like cakes and cookies and I'm craving alcohol like unbelievably. And I'm wondering if it's because I beefed up the sugar, if, if that's perpetuating this whole situation and if like aminos could help with that problem. <laughs> Because oh, okay, uh, let's stop right there. Uh, what a great question um, from, a, from a person, just the kind of person that we are having this event for. Um, so it's probably all of the above. You know, if, if you're um, fairly recently um, off of alcohol uh, and for a time at least sugar, um, there are a number of vulnerabilities that you have. One is you, you may very well have uh, some genetic tendencies towards addiction, meaning that your brain chemistry is vulnerable in one, of the, one or more of those five departments. And being alcoholic and using sugar just exaggerates that problem. You know, you get the, the instant relief, but, but then you get um, a deterioration in your ability to generate your own positive feelings. And... Uh, and eliminate cravings so that you have a normal appetite for healthy food. Um, so yes, you are in a perfect, it's a miracle, frankly, that you're still sober after a year. You know, most people have relapsed. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, so, it's so this, is the, this is the piece that you're uh, missing. And um, so for example, if you worked with Chris, she would immediately help you identify which are the right ones, uh, which are the right aminos for you and help you track and make sure that you're eating, you know, well. Um, you can also uh, read books. <laughs> um, and uh, I, uh, I highly recommend um, Seven Weeks to Sobriety. It's the best book ever written on alcoholism. Oh, wow, okay. And uh, my own book, The Mood Cure, has uh, a chapter on alcohol and, and addiction to alcohol and other drugs. Um, but uh, this is a great resource for finding, you know, people like Chris who can support you um, in getting rid of, you know, both of these addictions. And I know that Chris, um, like a lot of us, uh, is looking for ways to make, um, you know, our knowledge more available and uh so we've reduced the price of membership to to the organization um chris has uh, created uh services that um that are cheaper uh during this time and uh so i'm sure you can find the help you need kim and you can contact us at the alliance if you don't find the help we'll make sure you get it well, thank you very much, Ed. I don't want to take up too much time, but it makes okay, a lot of sense. Thanks. Okay, I really appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And we're, I think there's a few more folks that raised their hand. If you can do that again, I'm doing the best I can on this um, huge group here. Do we have another hand raise? Um, okay, we have, um, is it Jeff? Well, that's yes. a good Yes, go ahead, Jeff. Yes, thank you. For Julia. Thank you. Yes, my name is yes. my name is Estella, and I'm new no. to amino acid. One of the question is that uh, um, we should be the um, the professional in order that uh, would can um, give you some amino acid. Can you take many amino acid? I have no idea about amino acids. Well, you yeah, you need some information. And so the, uh, what kind of addiction are you talking about? Well, um, I don't have any um, food addiction. My husband has a, is low, low glycemic, not enough uh, um, sugar in the blood. It's not an addiction, this is what they're talking, okay. not enough okay, sugar so in the blood. Okay, so he's looking so for he something to keep his blood sugar level yes okay so that's that's easy um and uh the the name of the uh amino acid is glutamine 
Um, I would recommend that you read my book, The Craving Cure. Um, okay. Uh, which, and if, if all you do is take, have him take the questionnaire mm -hmm. and then read chapters 11 and 12, that's all you have to do, and that will tell you exactly uh, how much glutamine and, and anything else that he might need to keep his blood sugar stable. But he uh, can also uh, get help from a practitioner um, if you need that. Um, and so if you think you need that, we can get you a list of uh, people um, I have a virtual clinic for food-related addictions, mm -hmm. um, so that you know that may be helpful for you at some point. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So maybe we'll go um, with one more question um, because it is the top of the hour. And um, um, oh wait, go ahead, Carolyn. I Carolyn, I can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. I'm just suggesting that everybody who has a question, write their question at the bottom of the chat so that we have a copy of what you want to know and we can get back to you or we can answer it the next time that we have this because we do it every month. We can either bring Julia back or we can have some way to get this message of your answer. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, we can break. We can promise that we will answer those questions uh, promptly. Yes. Um, I'm just sorry that um, that there's not more time to get a sense of, of uh, what you guys all need. Uh, but one of one of the things that's obvious just from these two questions is that um, you want resources so that you can get started. Yes. And um, if you will uh, send us your email address. Um, we, uh, we are, are going, to, we have a document that summarizes everything about using amino acids, um, specifically for people, uh, during this time of COVID who don't have the bandwidth to read a book, um, or perhaps the money to get help. And, uh, so with the permission of the Alliance, we, which I think is forthcoming, um, we can send you the um, this short, uh, relatively short, concise um, set of directions. Uh, set of directions. Of it's course, a every member of the alliance will have okay. it uh, eventually. Uh, but those of you who are not members um, who have who need it right away, um, we will do our best to get it to you. If you will leave your email address uh, along with anything, any other messages or questions that you have for us. So Julia, I wanna thank you. Um, I do wanna mention that um, um, as a member of the Alliance, and we are having this special right now, um, we have round table discussions for our members where you get to actually work more closely with Julia and other professionals. Um, like Chris and many others who are trained um, and ask questions like this. And your uh, membership also helps support us as an organization to give these types of educational talks out to our communities. So please join our nonprofit um, and help support us um, in delivering messages like Julia's and Chris's and many others. Um, and we really are excited. There were so many people here on this call and we're, we're here to help, help people look at how they can use food and amino acid therapy and many other therapies to help with addictions and mental health. And um, I think we're, we're, we're good. Um, anything else you want to add, Julia, to finish? No, just that this is exactly why we put this particular event on, was to reach more people than we usually do uh, with with this life giving information so thank you all for coming and stay in touch leave us your email address we will yes. stay in touch with you thank you Julia and you can sign up for our newsletter on our website so please make sure to do that as well as become a member thank you all
be, uh, be safe, eat well, and uh, we'll see you next month for a wonderful, another wonderful call for our community.